Good morning to everyone who's joining us for the Sunday morning message from the Smith's Cove Baptist Church this Sunday, March 27th. We're uh, gathered safely this morning and preparing to deliver a message that we all need to hear. Our scripture reading this morning is not really lengthy, probably one of the most well-known Bible verses, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, your word, long or short, is eternal. And your word, Lord, is for us to find you and to relate to you and to receive life and blessing from you. So we ask your word to be written upon our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In a few short weeks, we'll arrive at Easter, and similar to the weeks leading up to Christmas with the Advent season, I'd like to center the messages leading up to Easter to be about Easter. Hopefully this will have our hearts and our minds towards this life and the world changing, uh, uh, this world changing event in history. Maybe this focusing on Easter before Easter gets here will help us better prepare for Easter and its true meaning for us as Christians. I shared just a single verse from the New Testament this morning, John 3.16. The truth be known about John 3.16, there's probably an endless amount of commentary and books and all that written about, well, at least John's gospel, but even this single verse. And when you consider what's contained in John 3.16, this well-known and most popular verse probably from the Bible, what more from Scripture would we need? Some have said that really if there was no other Scripture other than the Gospel of John, that would, that would suffice. God's revelation to us through Jesus Christ. And if you wanted to narrow the Gospel of John down to one verse, maybe John 3.16, because it includes all that we need to know of God and his love for us and what God wants us to do in response to this love that he has for us, his gift of salvation. I call this message the two loves of Easter because there is love on both sides of the cross. Before the cross, before Jesus died the cruel death that he died on Mount Calvary, God was in the process of supplying the world with his love. And all this through his endless grace. So in your mind, try to divide time before and after the cross. We have a time before Jesus' death, and then in the middle, the story of the crucifixion. We have that time after the cross, after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now before the cross, a few of the most significant events and for all of humanity, of course, one was creation. And then second, we have the, the fall of humanity. Sin entered human life, the Garden of Eden and humankind. And ever since that moment, humanity has been destined to die, separated from God because of our sin. Now God gave humanity his moral codes of laws. These are the commandments. He gave them to us through the Jewish people. God chose them to be a nation of people that he would use to show himself to the rest of the world. You get this story in Genesis and Exodus. And God ends up setting up a temple on earth for a place for his people to worship him. But the, the God of creation was inaccessible to the majority of the world, that only a certain few could be close to God. At first, the temple and its aspects of worship were restricted only to the Jewish people. Even inside the temple, there was division. There was a curtain separating the holy portion of the temple from the holy of holies, where the ark was sitting, where God was between the cherubim. The priest, one man, would enter that area of the year once a year. From the time that sin entered the world, the fall of humanity, from God's presence, till the advent of God coming to earth in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, 
there had not been such a pivotal, monumental moment in time. The kingdom of God had arrived. Jesus continually tells us in the Gospels that the kingdom of God is at hand. The time of the Messiah had finally come. Salvation would be coming for the nations. And during this time, the love of God was explained. The Old Testament, what the, the people then at that time had for scriptures, it was explained, it was actually shown in the life and actions of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. A time like no other since the fall, since sin entered God's world of creation. Now during this time prior to Jesus' arrival, the grace of God abounded. And even as you read through the Old Testament, there's much that can be seen as judgment all through the Old Testament. We also find God's love and God's favor, God's grace. He didn't completely destroy humanity, which he could have at any time. For God so loved the world that he constantly, consistently poured out his grace, his love for his chosen people. And even though they rebelled, the world was nearly completely destroyed by the flood. God kept a remnant to repopulate the earth. Hundreds of years later, from an important part of the Old Testament, when God freed the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery, God was with the children in the, uh, of Israel in the wilderness. God had them travel around there 40 years in the desert before they arrived at the promised land. God almost destroyed them all and would have had Moses not begged for God to spare them. For Moses, throughout all of the kings of Israel, God continued to be merciful and showing judgment as well, but showing love, forgiveness, and mercy to the rebellious and adulterous nation of Israel. God so loved the world that he sent prophets and leaders who would lead the people back to righteousness to following the laws that God had issued. God promised that he would send a savior, one who would bring reconciliation, who would bring healing and forgiveness and love to a sinful and broken people. One who was innocent and holy, but one who would be sacrificed, one who would be willing to suffer and die all because of love because of God's love that overruled all that was wrong in creation. God so loved the world from the moment of creation and humanity's eventual fall from grace that God was still in love with his creation. But the relationship needed repair. The repairing of the relationship is Jesus' birth, his life and death, when God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This is God born in the flesh. God loves us so much that he was willing to come to earth in the form of a man. The man, Jesus Christ, and live as we do. He ate. He suffered hunger. He worked. He slept. He was tired. He cried. He interacted with the rest of humanity. The uniqueness of Jesus is that he was fully human, but he was also fully God. Jesus did not sin. And Jesus, knowing what was at stake, knowing that it was he that was to be the holy and perfect sacrifice without sin, without defect, out of love for his heavenly Father and out of love for his creation. That's us, humanity that he was obedient to his heavenly father, even to death. There's no other reason than love. Not duty, but love. This is the love of God for us, for you and for me, for the ones not here this morning who are still lost, still dead in their sins. We need to remember that the love of God that he has for us, the saved, that his love is also for those who are not saved. He does not wish that any should perish, to be separated from him for eternity. As we try and understand this, as easy it is 
It is complex. But God loves those who we don't love. Those who we may in our minds, our hearts, those we reject. Those we deem unsavable or unlovable. Those we consider the worst of the worst. God so loves the world, the saved, the lost. He loves us so much that he was willing to die for us. And God gives us his son willingly, out of love. Jesus willingly gave himself to both God and us. Not begrudgingly, not against his will, but because of his love for us. This is the love of God, the first love of Easter. From creation to the cross. And now, after the cross, now that Jesus' initial mission has been completed as he's came to earth and he's died for us, not only do we thank God for Jesus' atoning death on the cross for us, but the good news is that Jesus is not dead. He has been raised to life, the first fruits of the resurrection, the Apostle Paul says, making a way that we can have access to God's continued love, mercy, and grace. He intercedes for us. Jesus is the mediator between our holy God and creator and us, a sinful, rebellious part of creation. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son that who would ever believe in him won't perish, but have eternal life. And as Christians, we know or we should know that we deserve to die because of our sins. And the only reason is that we as Christians will not die an eternal death, but will live an eternal life, is because of what God has done for us, out of love, through Jesus Christ. So I mentioned that the message was concerning the two loves of Easter. The second love of Easter this time, it's not all about the love that God has for the world. It's not about the love that God has for you and me or the lost soul whose life is still lived in the gutter and the trenches of sin. This second love of Easter is a response to the love of God that has come down to us from the heavens. This second love of Easter is like a vapor, a mist that the sun's heating rays takes up towards the clouds into the heavens. Think of God's love for us as the rain that falls upon the earth. That's the first love of Easter. And after all that has been accomplished for us by God through Jesus, the skies are now clear. A process of evaporation, if you like, begins to take place. God has sent his love down to us like rain, and now the sun begins to heat up the earth, and the sun begins to mo cause that moisture to radiate back up into the heavens. This rising up, this evaporation is the second love of Easter. It is our love that is returning to God where it first came from. God is love, the author of love, the author of our salvation. Now is the time, after the cross, because of God's love in the cross, because he has chosen to give us life instead of death, now this second love of Easter, our love for God returns to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's us. That's an untold number of people around the world and God only knows the number of those who will receive eternal life. God has given us everything out of love. What are we giving in return? How is it that we show our love, the second love of Easter? How is it that we are showing our love to him? Is it anything close to the way that he has shown his love for us? Regrettably and honestly, it is not. Oh yes, we may make it to church some. We may sing and we may pray. Is it always out of love or is it sometimes out of duty? What's expected of us? How is it that we show our love for God? What do our hearts say? 
What does the Holy Spirit tell us when we quiet our minds? The truth. The truth, what the Holy Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit may tell you and I, the truth, I suspect, for most if not all of us, the truth hurts. And we know deep in our hearts that we don't always measure up. We know in our hearts that that mist, that evaporation and rising up of our love to God is sparse at times. It's like we're living in a desert and there is no moisture. Maybe in a desert like the children of Israel that they traveled around for 40 years. In the desert, with no moisture, nothing returning back to God. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus was critical of their religious leadership because that's what they were, religious. They wanted to be seen as nice, holy people, even though they were recipients of God's love. A lot of the time they were more interested in looking like they loved God instead of living and giving the love of God. The leadership wasn't willing to help the people. Jesus was critical of their hypocrisy. What did Jesus want? What did God want us to learn from Jesus? God wants us to love him. And we predominantly do this by loving others. Jesus, of course, you remember, he summed up all the commandments into two. And Jesus fulfilled all those commandments by loving God with all of his strength, his might, his heart and soul, and by loving his neighbor, which was and is the rest of humanity. This is the second love of Easter. Loving our neighbor, loving the saved sitting next to you, and loving the dealers downtown. Loving the ones that scoff at you for your faith or who may ridicule you for your love of God and the love of your neighbor. The second love of Easter is showing the same mercy and grace and love that God has shown us. Those who have believed upon him, those who will not perish but have eternal life. This second love of Easter will show this love of God to those who are in need. They're in need of the same sentence of life that we've received. But at the moment, they're under a death sentence. This is the second love of Easter. Our, rise, our love rising up to God. A pleasing sacrifice of our time or our resources, our hearts, our minds. Our souls rising up to God. This sacrifice is given to God. Shown to God by us as we show the love of God towards and for those who are still in darkness. We know people who are in darkness. Those who have not yet accepted. Those who have not yet believed in him, Jesus Christ. A pleasing sacrifice. An aroma pleasing to God like a mist or a vapor of our love for him rising up to God like our prayers. How are we doing at this love of Easter? We want the love of God. We want God to save the lost. But God wants us and needs us to do our part. Live our lives in such ways that we win over the lost. That they may see the light. That they may see the love of God in and through our actions and our love for him. Not to be standing over them and judging them like the religious of Jesus' time. These were opponents of Jesus. But these others, living in darkness, loving them despite their sinful ways. Why not? God loves you and I, despite our sins that we commit each and every day. Or are we righteous in our own minds and better than those who don't maybe attend church or have all the religious regulations down pat. Who did Jesus hang out with? He was even ridiculed for that. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners. Who did he spend his time with teaching and loving and caring and healing? 
Jesus came to earth to show us personally. He came to save and to heal those who were ill, those who were outcast, those who were at the what we would call the bottom of the barrel, at least in the eyes of the self-righteous. Our love for God, the, the second love of Easter, is shown to our Creator. Our loving God by the way that we love others. So what ways can you or I show God's love to someone in our reach, in our circle of influence, in the pathways of our lives? This is God's will. We often wonder, what is God's will? When we always know. Love is a two-way street. Or a coming down from the heavens to us and our returning this love of God through Jesus Christ back up to God and to others around us. These are the two loves of Easter. God loves the world. He has already given his one and only son, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And as we believe upon him, his death, atoning for our sins, we may die a physical death here on earth, but we'll never die an eternal death. This is God's love for us, showering down upon us. And this second love of Easter is our love returning to the sender. Return to sender, the author of love. And in doing so, others in need of God's love around us, they'll know that they are loved. Many people just don't feel that they're loved. Maybe some of us. Let us pray that people find God through Jesus Christ, who's died for us all. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for your eternal love. Your unwavering love, Lord, has not changed since you created all of creation. Yes, Lord, you gave us the laws, the commandments. And through the Jewish people, you gave them those commandments, and they have become the moral compass, the guide for all of the world. None of these other gods have done such a thing. But you, the one true living God, the creator of all things, have given us ways to be with you. A moral compass, your, your son, Jesus Christ, because we couldn't keep all the laws. You love us. You've made a way that we can be reconciled to you through Jesus' sacrifice. And we thank you and praise you now and forevermore. For you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we consider all that you've done and all that you promised to do for us in our futures with that life in the new kingdom. May we forever praise you and thank you. We lift up those, Lord, who are, are ill, those who are in the hospital or in long-term care. We pray your blessing upon them for strength, for their spirits to be lifted. Help them through these journeys, Lord, each and every one. Use us where you see fit, Lord. Use us to show your love. Be with those who are mourning loss of loved ones. And Lord, protect us, each and every one, our families. Spread out over your world near and far, we ask a blessing of your protection upon us. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessings to each of you for your week ahead, and don't forget, you've got to keep washing your hands.